Hello. Second part of stave two today, up to page 60 from 52. So as per, make sure you've read that first. Um, all right, today we're gonna to look at our old pal, the Cratchits. Um, and this is a really, 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 really important point in the novella. Holistically, in terms of character development, in terms of foreshadowing, in terms of change, in terms of everything, it's a really key point. So don't just kind of just do the bits that I'm talking about, you know, look for stuff on your own too. Okay, so we come into the uh, Cratchit's dwelling and he sprinkles it with his torch. And again, we get this kind of meta, um, you know, Dickens on your shoulder telling you the story um, kind of feel to it again. He says, think of that. Bob had but 15 Bob a week himself. He pocketed on Saturdays, but 15 copies of his Christian name. And yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-roomed house. So, wow, think about that. You know, he knows that Bob Cratchit's there and he will bless it. Yeah, again, this idea that the ghost is kind of ever-changing and can kind of adapt to any kind of situation. Um, you know, the grandest hall and the smallest room. And he's present everywhere as long as people kind of ask for him and let him in almost. So, there's that kind of meta again, Dickens on your shoulder explaining kind of the story and kind of um, referencing us as well because again it's a story about us not just Scrooge. Then we meet uh, Mrs Cratchit, Bob's wife and she is dressed out but poorly in a twice turned gown. So what this basically means is that she's worn a dress and it's got dirty and um, you know washing was was you know a difficult thing and also cost money so she turned it inside out and wore it like that. But then that side has actually got dirtier than the original dress side. So she's turned it inside out again. So we're seeing a symbol of the poverty there. Yeah, it's a microcosm. It's a microcosm of the poverty that the Cratchits are in. The twice turned gown. Not only is it just a dirty gown, but it's also been turned inside out twice because that's not their priority. Now, we also get another bit of um, kind of representation of this poverty. Master Peach, yeah. Master Peter Cratchit, say that five times fast, is wearing a monstrous shirt collar. So this, you know, this kind of sun is there with a massive shirt collar, you know, Harry Hill style. But it's not intentional. So it's Christmas Day and they get, they're getting dressed up. You know, it's a big occasion. And again, you know, it's cheaper just to give him one of Bob's, um, Bob's shirts, even though they don't fit and it looks kind of ridiculous. But you can imagine. And they're happy. They're happy with it. Um, you know, he finds himself gallantly attired. He feels great. He looks in the mirror like, yeah, I'm the man kind of thing. And again, you know, they're happy. They're not kind of miserable despite having nothing. And obviously the juxtaposition of that is Scrooge is miserable despite having everything that he wants or in terms of possession, everything that he wants. So as we go down, we meet more of the family. And, you know, there's this quote here. Look, there's such a goose, Martha. As in, they're so impressed with it. Yeah, we've got the kind of graphological element as well, wherein the italics are used so that we know which words should be emphasised when it's read. They're such a goose, Martha. They're so happy with this this bird. Obviously, turkey is the traditional one, but obviously it was a lot more expensive. So, wow, what an amazing goose. Again, they're happy with what they got. We're seeing a pattern here, okay? And it's building this image against Scrooge almost. Dickens is building this image of... Look at all these things that these people have, or don't have even, compared to the person that's watching all this happen. And obviously remember how Scrooge is as an employer, because the Cratchits are living off the very little pay that he gives Bob. Now the whole thing happens, and uh, Bob Cratchit arrives, and he's got a tiny Tim on his shoulder. And Martha decides to hide, to, you know, just kind of a family little joke, oh, let's hide and pretend that I'm not here. And... Um, you know, he says, where's our Martha? And his wife says, not coming. And he says, not coming? Not coming upon Christmas Day? Now that quote there, yeah, real contextual point there, that he's he's so disappointed, he's so sad, he's really gutted that he feels like his family won't be with him on Christmas Day. Now obviously, think about the juxtaposition there between Scrooge's family and the Cratchits. Yeah? 
Scrooge is not unhappy for um, not being with family on Christmas Day. He's, he seems perfectly fine with it. And also, Fred has asked him several times to come to dinner on Christmas, and he refuses every time. And as we're going to see in the next section, so in the next video, Fred doesn't have the same kind of reaction as um, Bob when he finds out that Scrooge obviously isn't coming again. So again, a big juxtaposition there. The idea of Christmas Day, the kind of the birth of their of their God, and um, he finds it unbelievable that she would not be there. And obviously she is, and she comes out and surprises him. It's a lovely kind of family scene um, with the correct chits. Now as we go down, um, we get a kind of a, I think an intratextual reference again. The wife asks, um, and how did little Tim behave? And the husband replies, as good as gold. Now, obviously that's a phrase that we all use, as good as gold. But that simile can have more meaning for us because we know what's happened here. And obviously, again, we need to be masters of English. We need to be able to read into things that maybe aren't even there just to show that we have that level of perception and kind of critical thinking. So he says, as good as gold and better. Okay. Now, think about how gold has been used so far in this in this novella. Okay. It's been, you know, Belle used it as the reason that she broke up with Scrooge. An idol has replaced me. A golden one. Yeah. The idea of gold and worth and money have become something that have kind of destroyed Scrooge's life. His entire life and even his soul... A3 context, have been um, kind of dampened and uh, ruined by gold and by wealth and by worth, monetary worth. So we see um, that ironic simile, and also these are the comparative, and better. That actually, he's as good as gold and even better. And obviously we can read into that that, yeah, money's probably quite nice, but it's not everything, and it doesn't equal happiness. When he doesn't buy happiness is basically the message behind that little quote there. So we also hear from uh, Tiny Tim as well. So Bob says that he told me coming home that he hoped the people saw him in the church because he was a cripple. And it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Now, also, that's a reference to um, Jesus. Jesus. To Jesus. Jesus Caesar. But I suppose the Romans weren't a big fan, were they? Um, you know, he's using his situation to benefit other people, despite how awful a situation it is for him. You know, he'll be constantly in pain. He has very little mobility. Um, he's seriously ill. And yet he is trying to use his situation to make others feel better. Oh, I hope they saw me so they can remember that Jesus healed people like me and that will make them happier. Why are you talking? You know, he's using his own situation um, to benefit others. And, you know, despite being very ill and uh, despite not being in a good place at all, you know, he, he does not have a good life. He's, he's seriously ill. He is, um, you know, very lacking in mobility. He'll be in a lot of pain all the time. He's still using a situation to make others feel better. Now, obviously, again, huge juxtaposition to how Scrooge uses his own situation. Yeah? If Tiny Tim can be grateful for what he has and what he can give to others, surely Scrooge can as well. And obviously then, surely we can too as an audience. Now as we move down, we see that Bob's voice was tremulous when he told this and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. Tiny Tim is not growing strong and hearty. He's not doing well. But Bob is optimistic. He's trying to be optimistic and he's trying to be um, a good father, basically. But his, his voice is trembling. Yeah, there's the emotion coming there. If you think about how, again, Scrooge is always described as very monotone and kind of compared to Bob, you know, he's, his, the emotion is very clear in Bob. So then after this, we get a whole thing about all the different foods and stuff and their Christmas meal. Puddings, um, the potatoes, all that kind of stuff, the goose, and definitely get some of those ideas down. I'm not gonna go through them in massive detail, but what I, want you to do, what I do want you to think about, sorry, is why is Dickens describing their food so much? You know, Dickens knew that this would be a novel that people reread. This is not a, a novel that is kind of read just for pleasure. It's a moral novel, okay, or novella. 
and um the fact that he describes so much of it is something we definitely could think about he obviously wants the audience to focus on this part and again i think it's about kind of the idea of them being so grateful them being so thankful being so humble as well and dickens wants us to know that okay we need to learn from this part that yes they don't have the most amazing you know meat they don't have the most amazing um potatoes or whatever it is but it's good for them and they're happy with it and they're grateful for every little thing they have basically they are the absolute antithesis of scrooge the absolute antithesis they are everything that he's not and he is everything that they're not is probably the simplest way of thinking about it now after all of this description we get down to the end of the the meal and you know they say a merry christmas to us all my dears god bless us and everyone re-echoes that and everyone says it and then tiny tim says uh god bless everyone said tiny tim the last of all people who are religious if you are religious and you say bless you really meaning it that is a genuinely really kind thing to do yeah um because you believe that there's something that's higher power and you believe that that thing you want that thing that being to help someone else yeah so it's it's a kind gesture and he's saying god bless us everyone so he's not just saying god bless me god bless my family he's saying god bless everyone it's a kind thing for tiger tim to do again especially with this situation that he is not he's not self-centered and he's got every right to be self-centered but he's not he's still thinking about others he's still thinking about how we can help other people and we get the other kind of um, reference to bob again his father bob held his withered little hand in his as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side and dreaded that he might be taken from him okay so again we're reminded that tiny tim despite what he said up here that he's hearty and strong you know willpower isn't always everything and um in their situation medical treatment was was not an option for families like this no way of them having treatment paid for by someone else it would have been had to been paid by them and obviously a reminder there of um bob the father kind of realizing that this is probably not going to go well for him but he's trying to be positive he's trying to be optimistic think about you know the poor law that we talked about before in stave one as well in terms of context you know that was the beginning of a welfare state and of kind of the state stepping in to help people in need but it did not include stuff like medical bills so yes it was a start but still very lacking and obviously it took a long time for that kind of stuff to come in um two world wars even for the nhs to to come in now then we all get the news that is not what we want to hear scrooge asks him if tiger tim will live and the ghost replies i see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner if these shadows remain unaltered by the future the child will die so there's that conditional there if yeah the only bit of hope really that scrooge has got if these shadows remain unaltered by the future the child will die remember like the state uh stave one remember like the ghost of christmas past talks about they're shadows of what has been they're not kind of actually live there they are just kind of projections almost of what has ha what's happened and what's happening that scene has actually just happened but they are shadows and if it remains unaltered by the future so if nothing else happens tiny tim will die okay so we see a real connection with scrooge there we then see another kind of good intertextual reference i think what then if he be like to die he had better do it and decrease the surplus population now the ghost is saying that to scrooge obviously well aware that scrooge has said it you know um the day before um and scrooge is faced with his own his own character doesn't like what he hears we're starting to see some recognition we're starting to see some um admission of i get it i'm I'm really starting to get it now he hangs his head so he is upset by it physically and he was overcome with penitence and grief so you know this man who you know external heat and cold and influence on scrooge is suddenly now it's starting to be much more than a little uh, um stutter little influence 
it's starting to be a much more kind of potent and um, aggressive and active um, emotion that he's feeling. And he's connecting as well. He's starting to empathize. Now, this quote kind of seems a bit weird, but um, it will make sense later on in the in the stave. He says, none other of my race will find him here. So obviously the idea is that the, the present is constantly dying. Yeah, because the present is only right now and then it becomes past. And then the you know a new a new version of present will, will exist. So that's the idea there, in that none other of my race will find him here. So he will no longer exist in the present. He will be history. He will be the past. We're also seeing Scrooge's role changing in in this um, in this novella. He's no longer just about learning about his own past. It's about actually changing what is going to happen and the kind of the um the effect that scrooge has it's kind of a gradual expansion you know it starts off really small with scrooge and then slowly throughout the novella the kind of the area effect almost spreads and scrooge learns what effect he has on on people around him yeah family employees strangers in the street and that's what this novella is kind of becoming but it's becoming a slightly different angle because it's not just about his own past anymore. Yes, we've learned about him. We know why he is like he is. And now we need to see the effects of what's happening. Yeah. They've started with the with the kind of the reason, the why. And now it's the what, what's happening. And then eventually it'll be the how. How do we change it? Now we see an interesting little switch here as we go down. We see the ghost, you know, Scrooge won't look the ghost in the eye. And the only thing that makes Scrooge look up is hearing his own name. And we're still in the same scene. Mr. Scrooge, says Bob. I give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. If that doesn't say something about Bob's character in the Cratchits, I don't know what does. Yeah, that is hugely symbolic of the way that they are and the, the, the character that's developing within them. Okay. Despite the way that Scrooge treats them and how little he pays them, He's still thankful for him. He's still raising a toast to, to Scrooge. Despite all of Scrooge's faults. That is kind of real kind of character there from Bob. He's a real good man. There's a great little metaphor here, look. Oh God, to hear the insect on the leaf pronouncing on the too much life among his hungry brothers in the dust. Yeah? So there's that metaphor that the ghost is talking about when he's talked about the surplus population and quoting Scrooge and saying, Oh, how, how weird and ironic it is that the insect that's on the leaf, that's got all the food and everything that it needs, is pronouncing on the too much life. So it's it's saying that, you know, too many people have got life and, um, you know, they don't deserve it and they should just always die. Well, it's rich coming from you because you've got everything you need. Yeah, so we've got that kind of metaphor that, that helps us and Scrooge understand what, what the ghost's point is, really. Now, the mentioning of Scrooge kicks off Mrs. Cratchit and it brings a dampening mood. But Bob says calmly, look, my dear, who's Bob's mild answer, Christmas Day. That yes, do you know what? He might not be the nicest man, but it's Christmas and we should thank him because we should be thankful for everything that we have. And we wouldn't have everything we did have even if we, you know, if I was unemployed. So again, we're seeing a real strong character from Bob there. We see that Scrooge was the ogre of the family. Yeah. So he's been described as um, an insect on a leaf telling everyone else they should die. And now he's been described as an ogre. Yeah, there's a lot of metaphorical language here from uh, the Ghost of Christmas Present. There's a pattern of that. And we all know we love a pattern. But it does say it was not dispelled for five minutes. As if Scrooge's name is this horrible, wicked curse. The idea of the not dispelled for full five minutes. Think about the fact that Dickens wants us to like the Cratchits. Yeah, they are they are placed in a really, really positive light in terms of our perspective on them. Think about why he wants us to like them. Think about why they are placed on this kind of moral pedestal. And what lesson that needs to teach us and Scrooge. Okay? And that's an important point to think about. Why is why are they presented as such likable people? And why are they such likable people? Now as we move down, um, there was nothing of high mark in this. Okay. So Dickens is again reminding us 
every time he gives us kind of something great that the Cratchits do, he does kind of pull us back to reality and say, they don't have much. There is nothing of high mark in this. Nothing of extravagance. Nothing of what Scrooge would consider as worthwhile. Yeah? Remember what he said to uh, Fred in Stave 1, that, you know, how can he be so happy when he's so poor? Or when he doesn't have an extra penny in his pocket, or whatever it is, yeah? There's nothing of high mark in this. Now, they leave the Cratchits, and as they leave, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. So he's got this clear emotional connection to Tiny Tim. He's felt it. He's started to empathise. And he's really starting to feel bad about what happens. Because he knows that if nothing changes, Tiny Tim's going to die. So they go out and um, we get kind of a little sequence here of visiting other kind of areas, not just in the kind of centre of London, but in um, rural places, in places that you wouldn't expect to find life even. And how the Christmas spirit is still live there. And yet... With Scrooge, it's not. So we get this whole kind of description of kind of going through and seeing loads of different people running around and whatever. And we go to somewhere that is lower, lower, lower yet, was lost in the thick gloom of darkest night. That superlative, okay? And Scrooge asks where they are. He said it's where the miners live, who labour in the bowels of the earth. But they know me. See? So even the people who are, you know, the miners who are the furthest from humanity almost, and in the bowels of the earth, even they have got the Christmas spirit. Yeah? And they kind of, they see this lovely little scene of, you know, the kind of the merriment and all the joy and all that kind of stuff. They then move on to a place, that, you know, a reef, sunken rocks, uh, a solitary lighthouse. Okay? Think about where we've heard that word solitary before. Solitary is an oyster for Scrooge. So this person is just as solitary as um scrooge was or is and yet this one again very much gets involved with christmas is is joyful is is um happy and um is grateful really we see as well that in the lighthouse um they are humming they are humming a christmas tune and um i think that's kind of a microcosm basically of the point that they want to make that mild little reference that mild little recognition of christmas is a symbol for so much more you know all they're doing is just humming or they have a christmas thought or spoke below his breath to his companion of some bygone christmas day there's kind of tiny little things but they all are representative of a bigger idea that they are still grateful they're still thankful and they still they still have christmas yeah that kind of that idea of having this abstract thing that makes christmas and yet scrooge still does not okay that's kind of it for this one um and the last one we're going to go and see uh scrooge's nephew so if you want to read the end of stave three for me lovely uh any questions let me know and i'll see you soon stay safe bye